Aboriginal people have been inventors, designers, and engineers for thousands of years. People like David Unipan, he's a gentleman on our $50 note. In his day, he was known as the Australian Leonardo da Vinci, who came up with 19 separate inventions, including a breakthrough tool that revolutionized sheep shearing in Australia. There was Harold Thomas, designer of the Aboriginal flag, and going way, way back, the Niamba people from Brewarrina, who 40,000 years ago engineered one of the oldest man-made structures on Earth, the stone fish traps. Aboriginal people have had a very long history of ingenuity and creativity, but sadly, the contemporary story is not what it should be. When I started studying at university seven years ago, I was just one of three Aboriginal people studying information technology. In 2017, I stand as the first Aboriginal person to be accepted into my university's IT Honours course. This year, there are only two Aboriginal students studying information technology, and roughly 330 Aboriginal people enrolled in IT courses across all Australian universities. So in a country of about 24 million people, the odds of running into an Aboriginal IT student is one in 73,000. Wayne Denning, creator of STEM IM, has said that if you do not have a reasonable degree of digital literacy by the age of 20, you are at a distinct disadvantage, regardless of which path you want to take. So if we're really serious about closing the gap for Australia's first people, then I believe that promoting and educating digital literacy is one step towards overcoming exclusion and disadvantage. I've seen this firsthand. In August, I travelled to Nullumboy, a remote Aboriginal community in the Northern Territory. I wanted to get an idea of where the locals were at with contemporary technology, how much they knew, how much access they had. What I found was quite shocking. There were locals who still lacked a basic understanding of the internet. Things like 3D printing, virtualization, blockchain were completely foreign to them. <laughs> I may as well have spoke about hieroglyphics. There were efforts made to address this situation, though. There was a local art gallery which had a dedicated room with seven desktop PCs, which is a big improvement off the two PCs previously. The library's technician told me that when there were only two PCs, there'd be a mad rush of students from the local primary school every afternoon, <laughs> which wasn't really fair because the fastest two students would always get there first. <laughs> he said students would wait for hours to be rotated for those two PCs, and the seven they have now is still not enough. These students, are not lacking in a curiosity or an eagerness to learn. What they lack is sufficient resources, resources that most Australian school kids would take for granted. The gallery is also battling to negotiate a better internet deal because the current monthly data limit is insufficient for their needs. And not only is there little or no hardware, there is not enough tertiary qualified Aboriginal people to be role models, to teach their mob how to make sense and get the most out of technology. And more fundamentally, in an age where most information is being digitized, Aboriginal people will be hampered in their ability to record and preserve their culture and open themselves to intellectual property risks without the proper education or understanding. Now, this situation is not unique to Nullumboy. Digital disadvantage is present in regional communities throughout Australia. And if we do not address this digital divide, we will only further entrench disadvantage and exclusion in our communities. Now, I don't believe this is the future for Aboriginal people. I believe this can change. I believe that after thousands of years of ingenuity, courage, resilience, that Aboriginal people are not only capable of embracing a digital future, that we are capable of contributing towards the ideas and technologies that will shape that future. Not only do I believe this, I have set out to prove it. To see how capable our upcoming students are, I designed a workshop. It ran for just an hour, and it was divided into three parts. In the first part, I showed the students an example of an indigenous business that produced bottled water we call Yaru water. I showed them how Aboriginal people can be entrepreneurs, and that by setting up businesses, they could support their communities through job creation and training. 
In the second part, I cover design thinking 101, how through empathy, students could work towards defining a problem to meet a need, how they could brainstorm potential solutions to meet that need, through to developing draft prototypes to test for feedback and improve their designs. And in the third part, I broke them into groups of four or five and I set them the challenge, come up with the next groundbreaking indigenous product or business. They only had 20 minutes before they had to present their ideas back to the group. And the presentations they gave were just amazing. Let me share with you one of the ideas that a group of four girls in Year 10 came up with. They called it Black to the Future. <laughs> a state-of-the-art cultural center built in the shape of a boomerang, which had three main areas. Upon entry, visitors would be provided a virtual headset and a center map. In the first area, people would see a digital recreation of Australia before European settlement, how Aboriginal people lived, how we hunted, how they worked the land. In the second area, people would see a representation of contemporary Australia, how Aboriginal people live in today's society. And finally, in the third area, people could see what Australia could look like in the future, a unified nation in which Aboriginal people had a high degree of digital literacy, which allowed them to work with all Australians to transform communities into smart cities and improve health outcomes for all Australians. So much that the students said that the journey through the centre was narrated by Auntie, who was the first recorded Aboriginal person to live to 150 years of age. Remember, the session was just 60 minutes. They only had 20 minutes to come up with that idea. The girls knew their idea would involve technology. And while they may not be across the intricacies of that technology right now, with a clear vision in mind of what they wanted to achieve, I could see they were prepared to take a deep dive into the nuts and bolts to make their dream a reality. My workshops have taught me that students are not inspired by what technology is. They're inspired by what it can do. I'm sure we've all experienced a situation where somebody is completely losing us by going into the minute detail about something extremely technical or abstract. <laughs> the sort of techie talk a geek like myself would love. <laughs> if someone talked about the various specifications of a 3D printer could be sleep-inducing without first being excited about its potential applications. But if someone told you that it could enable people in developing countries access to life-saving technology at a reasonable price, you might be just prepared to be lectured on how the thing actually works. I remember talking to students about drone technology. I started by talking about the various different components and technical specifications while I could see my audience's attention take flight right out the window. <laughs> I'd completely lost them on the technical detail. So, for the next audience, I started with a couple of stories about how farmers are using drones to better manage their properties, or how Aboriginal communities are using drones to survey traditional lands and map sacred sites. Now I had their full attention. They were open to understanding how technology works, because suddenly it was meaningful to them. I'll say it again. Students are not inspired by what technology is. They're inspired by what it can do. Show them how they can make a significant impact on their families and communities, and you will give them the motivation to make positive change. What if the next groundbreaking idea or technology is in the mind of a young Aboriginal student right now, but their idea will never surface because they face some form of digital disadvantage or exclusion? We have to make sure that we give our young leaders of tomorrow every opportunity for their ideas to be heard, every chance to make a positive impact on their families, their people and their communities. So as Australians, we have a choice. We can continue down the path of digital divide, disadvantage and exclusion, which will only leave our students discouraged and disconnected. Or, together, we can work towards removing these barriers so we can support our communities to prosper and grow. The choice is ours. Thank you. <laughs>